Hello and welcome to the last unit of this course on phonetics and phonology, a broad overview. We are talking about intonation now and uh, this is one of the lectures on intonation. So, uh, this is unit 8 in intonation and uh, content of this PPT has been taken from a few sources and the sources are cited there. So, uh, one course material from Jennifer J. Venditti and uh, MIT open courseware and that is the link for the courseware. So, we have been talking about intonation, how intonation is about sentence level of uh, fundamental frequency which changes the sentence level and that conveys a lot about the structure of sentences or we understand a lot about um, a communication is conveyed through intonation and those are the properties which we are talking about now. So, intonation makes a lot of difference in how we uh, say one sentence, how we differentiate one sentence from another sentence. So, let us uh, have a look at some examples and here are the examples. So, first we have a question. What types of foods are a good source of vitamins? So, uh, we can as a response to that question, we can have these answers. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, uh, you can hear that these two sentences, the two options that are given here. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. That where in sentence 1, where you have uh, vitamins and in sentence 2, you hear that legumes are standing out. This uh, word legumes is standing out in that sentence. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, both of these answers are possible to the question that we have in A. So, as a result, when we hear these two sentences, even though they are string identical sentences, what we understand from these two sentences are pretty different with regard to the emphasis, what is emphasized in uh, sentence 1, in B1 and B2, where in one sentence vitamins is emphasized in the other sentence legumes are, uh, we hear that more prominently. So, uh, now, let us hear another question here. I'd like to fly to Davenport, Iowa on TWA. Okay. So, this is not a question. So, it is a declarative sentence. It is a, a normal sentence, but there can be a few responses to that sentence. TWA does not fly there. So, someone can tell you that, um, no, that is not possible because uh, TWA does not fly there or you can say that if, even if it does not fly there, it flies to another location. They fly to the moon. They fly to the moon. So, now uh, what we hear is that in one sentence, the intonation lets you know about where uh, the possible flight destinations could be. Um, there is a difference in the way that is uh, the, the message is conveyed to you. So, in one sentence, it is a very pretty straightforward sentence uh, that they fly to Des Moines. They fly to Des Moines. And um, pretty straightforward and here it is more like um, you can hear that there is a difference in the way Des Moines is, you know, the intonation is um, structured there. They fly to Des Moines. Okay. Now, we will understand what these uh, properties are of intonation that they can make uh, those, those subtle things in intonation can make a whole world of difference in the way we uh, hear sentences and the way we communicate and we, the way we understand. So, now again another declarative sentence where you would hear uh, uh, two ways in which you can say a simple sentence. I met Mary and Elena's mother at the mall yesterday. Okay. I met Mary and Elena's mother at the mall yesterday. Okay, so again here you can emphasize different parts of the sentence and the intonational contour can add an additional meaning to the way uh, you can understand the sentence. Let us look at uh, this graphical representation of the F0 contour to understand intonation. Now, this is the first sentence that you heard as a reply to the question 
you heard here what types of foods are a good source of vitamins. As a response to that, we heard the sentence legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, legumes are a good source of vitamins. Right. So now, when you heard that, the intonation is making all the difference here because the intonation is um, conveyed in such a way that vitamins is emphasized and you see that because of the rise in the F0 contour towards the end of that sentence. So, and whereas we see the small rises and falls, but towards the end we see a, a big rise and a final fall. And that is how this sentence has been differentiated from the other sentence where it is said that. Uh, Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, let us see how that F0 contour is going to be different from uh, legumes are a good source of vitamins. But before we do that, let us also note that the F0 contour is not one straight line from the beginning till the end. There are these small rises and falls and it is not really one, uh, it does not start in one position and goes up and goes down. So, we have these uh, little things which are sort of interrupting the uh, flow from one part from, from legumes are a good source, then we have all these breaks and then the small rises and small falls. That is because of the consonants in between, because we have these small breaks, because we have voiceless consonants and then we have another break in the F0 contour because of the T in between. And similarly, we also have um, some peaks and some falls because of the consonants. So, here we because of G or Z or G again, we have these uh, F0 uh, falls uh, because uh, these are obstruents. So, and then again because of V again, you have a you know, small F0 fall. And what we are going, the point we are going to make is that, that the F0 contour is abstracted from the uh, F0 the sentence and it is these small rises and falls actually do not contribute to our hearing of the F0 contour. So, because these are these are consonantal perturbations and the consonantal per perturbations are not really contributing to the uh, way we hear the rise and the falls and these are below our a threshold of perception and what we hear is one F0 contour with rise and falls and these um, small perturbations which we see because the consonants um, are not considered to be a part of the intonation contour. So, now this is um, this type of a sentence where we have the wave uh, and the swell. So, this is the wave and this is swell if you if you want to try if you want to see it that way and you can see what is. So, this is a small um, F0 contour there is the, it starts at a around 250 hertz and goes uh, slightly around 300 hertz and this is like a small wave and then we have a, a big swell which we can say is the part where vitamins was produced. Now, um, we have been talking about stress a lot in this course. We had an entire um, lecture on stress and we know that stress is a structural property of the word and it marks a, a potential arbitrary location for an accent to occur if there is one. An accent is, um, is a property of a word in context. So, it is a way to mark intonational prominence in order to highlight important words in the discourse. So, um, that much we know about that stress is the structural property and we know that it marks the location for the uh, for an accent to occur. And now, how it is um, related to the sentential to, to the part in the sentence where a word is going to be accented is now those things are related because when something has to be accented, the international structure is going to target that part where uh, which is actually the location for the occurrence of uh, stress. So, uh, accent is a property in context and that is why we will see that given the meaning that one wants to convey that accent, the placement of accent is going to depend on the stress, but it is again going to target that part of the word which normally receives, uh, which is a location for the occurrence of the stress. Uh, let us see how that happens. 
So, uh, which word receives an accent then? So, it depends on the context. So, for example, the new information in the answer to a question is often accented, while the old information usually is not. So, we will look a bit at old and new information again in this lecture, but for the time being, let us um, look at the answers to the question, what types of foods are a good source of vitamins, vitamins. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, unlike legumes, now uh, we have seen the two, two sentences where legumes is emphasized or vitamins are emphasized, but um, good can also be emphasized. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, now you can see that the accent placement is varying in the sense that it could either be um, legumes, it could be good or it could also be vitamins. So, now what is the difference among these three sentences is that here unlike the first question where what types of foods of are a good source of vitamins, with the questions are different for each of these sentences. So, hence old information and new information is different for each of these sentences. Even though the sentences are string identical because they are answers to different types of questions which demands different answers, which are asking for different answers. So, are legumes a good source of vitamins? Legumes are a good source of vitamins and that is why even in the string identical sentence, the new information that is game provided here is good unlike a previous sentence where legumes was a new information which was conveyed there. And I have heard that legumes are healthy, but what are a good source, but what are they a good source of? So, if that is the question, then here the new information provided will be that legumes are a good source of vitamins. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, what are the good source of their vitamins, the good source of vitamins? And hence, the new information for each of these sentences are different here, legume is good information, is a new information here, good is a new information and vitamin here, vitamin is a good new information and you know, they are providing different new information in each of these sentences and therefore, what does it tell us about accent? It tells us that it can be context dependent depending on what information is being asked for, there the position of the accent may be different. What types of foods are a good source of vitamins? Legumes are a good source of vitamins. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, again, what we will see in the next slide is about tune and alignment. So, the same tune can have different alignment. So, now this uh, swell that we saw earlier, this can have different places. The swell can be on vitamins, the swell can be on legumes, it can be on good. And the main, uh, the rise, this is or technically it can be called the rise fall, is a rise and a fall. So, the rise fall can shift location, here it is on legumes, okay, because it is providing new information there uh, of what are a good source of vitamins. And here it is the new information provided is good because this is an answer to the question are legumes a good source of vitamins, are legumes a good source of vitamins and it is in the, the answer is in the positive legumes are a good source of vitamins. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, here again the um, rise fall is on the accented uh, word which has shifted its location to good instead of legumes as a result of different question. And as we saw before, here the, the new information is vitamins, hence the main rise fall is on vitamins. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, unlike any of these sentences, now here we have a sentence which is called broad focus, which just states a declarative um, sentence, which is a matter of fact sentence, which is which does not have to give any new information, the entire sentence is telling us something about something, a fact basically about something. So, uh, here as we can see, we do not have the rise fall pattern that we saw before and we have a normal sentence with normal accent and without focus placement. So, Earlier we saw focus placement, here we have normal accent, accented sentence. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, 
in the absence of narrow focus, unlike this sentence which is broad focus, so all the earlier examples can be called examples of narrow focus and unlike those we have this which is broad focus and in broad focus the first and the uh, last content words are the places which will receive accentuation in a declarative sentence, a normal broad focus declarative sentence. The first and the last content words receive some accent and this is called broad focus which is unlike the previous narrow focus sentences. And let us look at a few other question tunes. So, we have a tune here which is a yes no question tune. Are ligands a good source of vitamins? So, here a question is asked, uh, being asked whether legumes are a good source of vitamins and you can see that uh, this rise is very different from the rise that we saw in the other rise fall that we saw in the other sentences. The rise starts from the main accent and it goes all the way till the end of the sentence. So, this is a yes no question tune and then we have Are legumes a good source of vitamins? Here again when the accent is on good again we have the rise from the main accent from here. So, here it was from legumes. So, here it is from a good the rise starts from the main accent and then here if it is uh, this kind of sentence our legumes are a good source of uh, vitamins where it is a yes no question, but the accented word is uh, vitamins it will start the rise will start from the main accent to the end of the sentence. Are legumes a good source of vitamins? So, basically in these three questions the yes no question was asking about either legumes or about good or about vitamins. So, because the new information sought was of with regard to all these different words. So, hence the rise will start from the accented word. So, normal WH questions will have a different pattern. So, WH questions have uh, falling contours like statements. What are a good source of vitamins? So, as a response to that question we have Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, what are a good source of vitamins? Legumes are a good source of vitamins. And then we have rising statements. Legumes are a good source of vitamins? So, in this one, so this is a high rising statement and it seeks for some approval and hence this sentence is um, different from all the others that you saw here that this sentence is pretty much does not have any rise or fall all the way till the word vitamins where we have a very sharp rise. So, this is a, a sentence is a rising statement and this is also possible and this sort of asks for approval even though this is a statement. Legumes are a good source of vitamins? We can also ask a yes no question and not a statement and when it is not a statement and you are asking a question you have to rise from the main accent to the end of the word. Are legumes a good source of vitamins? So, there is a the subtle difference from this one and um, this one and legumes are a good source of vitamins? And unlike uh, those uh, sentences we have a surprise redundancy tune like this one which is expressing uh, surprise and it is a it has a low beginning for it and a gradual rise to the end of the word and in a final fall. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, this is a surprise redundancy tone which is in the sense that this sentence would mean that I already know this as a matter of fact, but then I am surprised that the, uh, the second person does not or you know, anybody in the audience does not know about it. So, this that is why it is called surprise redundancy. It is marked by gradual rise and then a final fall. Unlike that we can have a contradiction tune which would sort of try to contradict the, uh, the meaning conveyed by the sentence. So, this is a contradiction tune which would have a fall in the beginning unlike all the previous sentences and then low and then a final rising trend at the end. Linguine is in a good source of vitamins. Linguine is in a good source of vitamins. So, a fall and then a rise it is a contradiction tune. So, however, 
uh, one have to has to remember that the F0 contour aligns to syllables and it aligns to, uh, to particular uh, stressed syllables in a language like English. The examples that we have seen are all from English. So, there uh, the, the stress syllable is the place where the alignment is almost always happens. So, so, so here the rise starts from the stress syllable and let us play the sentence. They flooded the moon. So, this is the point where the rise starts for demoi. They flooded the moon. Unlike that sentence, the rise can be delayed. So, and then when that happens, it normally uh, implies uncertainty about whether something uh, is uh, possible or relevant. So, this is what it sounds like. They flooded the moon. Okay, so this is another text tune alignment. So now um, alignment with relation to syllables um, can have two distinct alignment uh, categories. So Pierre Humbert and Steele synthesized many intonation contours with varying degree of peak delay and asked speakers to imitate what they heard. And then peak delay of speakers responses pattern in two categories early and late. So, when they were asked to imitate, they would either imitate early or late and then uh, the two patterns early and late have two different intonational meanings. One is assertion and the other is suggestion. So, these could be understood as two different alignment categories. So, one early, if it is early uh, peak delay, then it is assertion. If it is late, it is suggestion. I'd like to fly the Davenport IRA on TWA. Okay, so uh, now as a response to this. TWA doesn't fly there. Or. They fly to the moon. They fly to the moon. Okay, so here this. They fly to the moon. They fly to the moon. Suggestion uh, versus assertion and um, we can hear this assertion the moon. versus the the moon. suggestion tune. So, um, now we have a single broad focus statement uh, tune here consisting of one intonation phrase and uh, that is one intonation tune in the whole sentence, but we can have more intonation phrases also. We will play those. Now, multiple phrases in this single intonation phrase, we can see that there is um, a rise, a small rise and then a, a wave sort which we studied earlier and then a final fall. So, this is what it sounds like. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. Okay. And unlike this, let us look at multiple phrases like these. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, here these utterances are chunked. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, when uh, that happens, we have a change in the tune of the same text. So, when we have multiple phrases of the same sentence, so legumes are a good source of vitamins. And um, we can play the sentence. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. And when we are playing this, we can hear that we, there is a rise and a fall and a rise again. This is an entire phrase by itself, legumes and then the final uh, part are a good source of vitamins. So, this is a chunking of uh, sm into smaller phrases in order to signal the importance of information in each unit. So, if you want to emphasize a lot on your legumes, it, it can be chunked separately uh, and the information conveyed there is that legumes are a, is a phrase by itself because of the all the intonational things happening here rise and a fall and a rise again. So, now we have seen all the different text to tune alignments which tells you different types of sentences assertion versus suggestion versus contradiction versus surprise. So, all these things can be the same text can be conveyed uh, using different tunes. Now, there is uh, intonation plays more roles um, than these. So, what are the other roles that intonation plays? Uh, phrasing, this type of phrasing that we just saw where legumes are a good source of vitamins uh, there using phrasing we can also disambiguate. So, 
between sentences which are already ambiguous. The old man or the old men and women stayed home and Sally saw the man with the binoculars and John does not drink because uh, he is unhappy. From what we know about um, sentence structure, we know that these sentences can be potentially ambiguous because of their syntactic structures. And so, these sentences though can be disambiguated using uh, intonation. So, how can these be disambiguated? This can be dis disambiguated by chunking as we saw previously into different parts. The old men and women stayed home and then here then old men and women uh, do not belong to one chunk. So, if they were one chunk then the old men and women stayed home or the old men and women stayed home. Or we can disambiguate the sentence Sally saw the man with the binoculars where Sally saw the man with the binoculars. So, these are two separate chunks and if we want to mean that Sally saw the man with the binoculars. So, these would be two different ways of chunking these sentences. And then John does not drink because he is unhappy, John does not drink because he is unhappy. Let us see how the chunking works for these different sentences. So, uh, when Madonna sings the song, uh, the song when Madonna, when Madonna sings, so let us just see this, when Madonna sings the song is a hit. Okay? So, when Madonna sings the song it is a hit. So, as we know that there are two ways of chunking this when Madonna sings the song is a hit and when Madonna sings the song it is a hit and um, these sentences can be, um, uh, so various people have experimented with um, ambiguous sentences and seen how chunking leads to um, ambiguity or temporary ambiguity as we saw here as in the uh, Madonna sings the song and then uh, this can be uh, disambiguated with further uh, in adding to the phrase uh, and then uh, chunking can lead to final more uh, disambiguation. So, let us see um, how this chunking can happen and we will play um, a few sentences how uh, phrasing leads to disambiguation. I met Mary and Elena's mother at the mall yesterday. Okay. So, or one intonation phrase with relatively flat uh, pitch range. So, it is a normal sentence with a starts with a rise and then a final fall and um, so, however, the sentence uh, says I Mary and Elena's mother at the mall yesterday. So, um, and then if we uh, use phrasing to disambiguate the sentence then um, the sentence will be will have all these different peaks where we separate Mary and as one phrase and then we know that Mary and Elena's mother will be in separate phrases and uh, will will not mean that Mary and Elena's mother were together. So, let us play the sentence and see uh, how the disambiguation can work. I met Mary and Elena's mother at the mall yesterday. Okay. So, that much about phrasing and disambiguation and how intonation plays a role in all these um, um, syntactic issues also where we have sentential ambiguity because of the in sentence internal structures. Now, a bit of um, discussion on focus because we studied, um, we have seen what given and new information is um, just a while ago. So, what is, uh, let us clarify a few of the issues. Given is previously mentioned information and new is not previously mentioned information. So, it is often suggested that new information tends to be accented while given information tends to be unaccented. And I found an article for you in a German journal, but I do not read German. And okay, so, um, this is new information, this is capitalized to tell you that this is new information. I brought her a bottle of whiskey, but it turns out she does not like whiskey. So, here given information uh, can be unaccented and here like is being accented because um, that is the uh, new information uh, which is given. So, this is something to remember new information tends to be accented while given information is unaccented which we also saw in the previous slides.
information conveyed by prosody uh, focus and focus is something which we saw in the previous slides and the focus is called the information part of an utterance and the information in the sentence that is assumed by the speaker not to be shared by him and the hearer. And presupposition or background, the information in the sentence that is assumed by the speaker to be shared by him and the hearer. And uh, there is substantial overlap between given new information um, on this view of presupposition where presupposition the information here that is assumed by the speaker. So, when something is assumed by the speaker then um, there could be some overlap, but very often in uh, intonation focus is marked by accentuation. And how is focus marked prosodically? Uh, it is clear that focus constituents contain pitch accents. We have seen the, the rise and the fall to show pitch accents in vitamins and legumes. So, those are what we call pitch accents, but non focus elements can bear pitch accents also. So, um, let us listen to this sentence. Mary married a man from Milan. So, who did uh, Mary marry? Mary married a man from Milan. So, this is your new information. Okay. Um, but if you, if the question who did Annabel marry? Annabel married Maloney. And then here, the hypothesis that focus is marked by the nuclear pitch accent. Uh, and we saw all those examples before in all those um, previous slides, but here um, we see something new here which you did not see in the previous slides. Here we see that uh, Mary which is already a given information is actually receiving a accent here. So, in all the previous example that we saw Mary uh, this part of the sentence when uh, there was just a simple wh question asking for information would not necessarily um, lead to accent placement on already given information which is Mary married someone. So, Mary is already um, assumed here and here Mary is receiving accent. So, this is called, called topic. So, in lot of languages is seen that topic placement can also lead to topic can also have some amount of accent placement on the topic and then uh, sometimes the topic gets accent placement because of issues like contrast. So, we wanted to highlight uh, some of these issues also apart from the ones that you have just seen about pitch accents and rise and uh, accents or new information. Semantically, focus um, can be a constituent and not just a word and it is often claimed that a constituent is marked as focus by placing pitch accent on the strongest stress in the phrase, usually the last content word. And this is called focus projection and in particular a transitive verb phrase can be marked as focus by placing a nuclear pitch accent on the object. So, focus is marked by pitch accents and focus is marked by a nuclear accent. In our uh, another lecture, we will talk about nuclear accents and pre nuclear accents. Pre nuclear accents do not mark focus, and all nuclear accents mark focus. Can all types of pitch accents mark focus? In uh, focus projection, accenting an object can mark the whole VP as focus. And a contrast which you talked about just now is marked by L plus H star that is a L tune plus a H star pitch accent and only given material can be deaccented. So, these are the references and this is the end of this lecture on intonation. Thank you for paying attention.